Okay, today we're going to talk about linear regression uh, of models that depend on multiple variables. So now we have variables x1, x2, and xk. Those do not represent uh, multiple observation of one variable. They are actually separate variables. So maybe y depends on uh, length, depth, and height of some object or something along those lines. Okay, so they all represent different things. Uh, so, so one of the simplest models that we might write down is that the dependence of y on these variables is as a linear combination of uh, those variables. So we have y is equal to an intercept, that is the value that y would take, that we expect y to take, uh, when all of these variables go to zero. And then we have uh, coefficients for each one of these variables. Those coefficients are beta 1 multiplied by x1 and on out till you get to beta k multiplied by xk. Okay, so this is the deterministic part of the model, is this beta 0 plus uh, beta dotted into the x vector, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, and then we have this random term, uh, that is the uh, residual uh, between, um, between this uh, prediction and the actual value of y that we might see on any particular measurement. Okay, so if we go down and, uh, and think now about what our data set is going to look like, um, suppose we collect n data points, right? And n better be larger than k if we're going to be doing regression. Uh, we, of course, need to have more data points than the number of coefficients that we're fitting. Uh, so n should be larger than k, and in fact, larger than k plus 1, since we have an, an, an uh, intercept uh, variable beta 0 as well. Okay, so we've got n data points. Uh, those are in the rows of this data set. So we, we collect values of x1 on the first data point, x2 on the first data point, and on out till we get xk on the first data point. And those gave us a value of y, that is y1 for the first data point. And we do that for the second data point and on down until we get to the nth data point. Okay, so that, that's the way our data looks. And uh, you can think of this part that depends on the x's as a matrix x of data and this column of y's as the vector of y's. Okay, so we will be formulating all of this in terms of matrix uh, equations here soon. Okay, so now let's suppose that we knew the values of beta 0 through beta k. Uh, then, then what would we have? We would have uh, that the ith data point in y is uh, the deterministic part of the model for those values of beta uh, in that data point, uh, xi. Uh, so I've got xi1 out to xik, and each of those are multiplied by the corresponding value of beta, which we're assuming that we know. And this would be the residual uh, that we would get for a model if we chose, if we had this data and, and these uh, coefficients in the model. Okay, so we can write that equation, right? There are going to be n of these equations, and we can write down all of them in a matrix equation, right? So here is the uh, matrix equation where I take my column of y observations, my uh, my matrix of x data and my um, and my uh, vector of coefficients beta and my epsilons are the residuals for each of those. Okay, so these are the definitions of each of those little characters. Here we have an n plus one uh, dimensional vector, n dimensional vector, and a uh, and a uh, n dimensional vector for the epsilon. Okay, so here are the the uh, here is the data matrix x. Note that there is a column of ones uh, right along this beginning. Uh, we've extended the, the uh, data vector x uh, so that it includes a, these ones. And those, those are basically the contributions from the intercept, right? So every one of these, when you multiply x by the vector beta, will give you a beta 0 term that does not uh, depend uh, that is not multiplied by any of these x variables, right? So this is just a way of, uh, this now is just a way of writing this equation uh, as, a, as a single compact matrix equation. And now when we want to go and compute the sum of square errors, right? That's uh, epsilon, I square, epsilon 1 squared plus epsilon 2 squared plus dot 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 out to epsilon n squared. We have n different data points. Uh, that's the same as taking this, this vector of residuals and dotting it into itself, right? So that's now the sum of square errors. And uh, we can write, going back to our original equation, we had y equals x beta plus epsilon. We can isolate epsilon in that by subtracting uh, the, the x beta from both sides. And that gives us uh, this way of writing the equation. Now you note that this is actually an equation that, that just has beta as the unknown. Uh, and and it's actually a pretty simple equation. So it looks, looks maybe kind of scary with the matrix notation. But really, this is just a second order polynomial in the beta 0, beta 1, beta 2, etc. 
Uh, so it includes cross terms and all those things. Uh, but you know, we know how to deal with all of that, uh, at least if we've taken some basic linear algebra, we know how to deal with it in matrix form. And even if you haven't, you know that this is just a second order polynomial and you could go through and compute these derivatives just keeping track carefully of the bookkeeping aspects of this calculation. Okay, so let's go ahead and assume uh, that you know the mechanics of differentiating things with respect to uh, components of a vector beta and to deal, know how to deal with all the matrix uh, products. And, uh, and so what we're going to do then is take a derivative of the sum of square errors with respect to this beta and that ends up giving me, um, giving me this, right? So this term vanishes. There was no dependence on beta here. Uh, this term was linear, all terms that are linear in beta. So it ends up just giving me an x transpose y, uh, and that's this term right here. And then you have uh, this term, which was quadratic in the beta. So I have a beta and a beta inside the same term. And that's going to give me a term that's going to end up being linear in the beta, in the beta vector, right? So, so these are the, the things that are left after I take that derivative. And we're requiring that this sum of square errors differentiated with respect to the beta be 0 when I choose the optimal estimate for uh, the um, for the beta vector, right? These are this this vector of coefficients that I'm estimating, and that should that derivative should go to zero when I have the best possible estimate. That is to say that we're making the sum of square errors a minimum. All right, so um, so now we have this equation. Uh, this thing should be equal to zero, uh, which we can rewrite uh, as this. And we don't want to just cancel off the x transpose over here. That would of course give us an equation that was true, uh, but we can't invert x. Um, you know, it's not a square matrix. So, so what is uh, the more more sensible thing to do is to invert x transpose x, and then use that inverse uh, to operate on the x transpose y. Okay, so that gives us that beta. Our estimate for beta is just given by this expression: x transpose x in parentheses with an inverse, and then that's multiplied by the x transpose y. All right, so that's uh, that's the mechanics. That's how it works. Um, so, um, so now we can go through and consider some examples. This one is from Montgomery and Runger. Uh, it is ch in chapter 12, and they consider the life of a cutting tool, which depends on the cutting speed and the tool angle. Uh, so you might write down a, a regression model. So this y would be the tool's lifetime, and the x1 would be the cutting speed, and the x2 would be the angle at which you're cutting. And uh, you can imagine that you're um, your uh, two axes, x1 and x2, are the, uh, are the independent variables, and then you have y as your dependent variable. And unlike in math, you know, where everything uh, falls on the, on the equation, we have these residual errors, right? So the data points don't really follow uh, the model exactly. Uh, and so some of them are, are above the line. These are these dark ones, and some of them are below the line, and those are those dotted, uh, dotted things uh, depicting data uh, with their projections back up and back down. Now the length of that vertical projection is the epsilon, right? So, um, so this is what we're minimizing, right? We're finding the plane that passes through this set of data and does so in a way that gives us the small, smallest sum of these squared epsilons. And that's what the multiple variable linear regression is doing. Okay, so, um, so they go through and they, they solve this problem uh, now thinking about a different model uh, where they have um, wires that are being being pulled until they break uh, with different attachments and they've got a uh, variable that that is the length of the wire and one that uh, depends on a die height which is the thing that the wire is attached to um, kind of a contrived model but anyway we've got strength y as a function of x1 and x2 they've taken 25 data points in this example and uh, and so you can see uh, that if you if you look at the strength of this variable y uh, and you cross correlate it with uh, the length variable, you get a pretty strong correlation. If you look at strength y cross correlated with x um, x uh, uh, one, you get a, a pretty pretty strong. Uh, sorry, strength y cross correlated with uh, variable x two um, is uh, much less strong effect. You can kind of visually see that here. Uh, and when you look at uh, x1 versus x2, you see that, that these variables are also pretty scattered. Now, now over here, we would say, well, maybe y doesn't depend that strongly on x2, or at least x2 is not, a very, good, not very good at predicting trends in y. Uh, over here, seeing scatter is good, right? So, so for this particular set of data, we don't want x1 and x2 to be variables that were chosen in a way that depends on each other. We want to be able to see uh, 
we want to be able to see how x1 and x2 interact if they do. And so we have to have uh, variations in x1 and x2 be independent from each other. And that means that this ideally should be even more scattered. We would like to have some points down here in the lower, in the lower triangle. But this is not so terrible, right? So we've got, um, we've got a nice scatter. x1 and x2 have been chosen in a, in a fairly random fashion. And we should be able to see uh, that they have effects that are separate from each other. If we had a line in this plot that x1 and x2 were just, you know, one predicts the other, then when we look at this multivariable linear regression model, we would not be able to say whether it is x2 that's affecting y or x1 that's affecting y because one of them could be determining the other one uh, before it ever sees its effect on y, right? So, so these variables would then be confounded, we would say, right? So, so it's good that we have this scatter here. Uh, so that all comes back to this idea of design of experiments, which we will revisit on another, on another day. Uh, I won't go through all the all the details here, but we had x1 and x2, so we've got beta1, beta2, and an intercept in our model. We have uh, our, our data vector x is uh, 25 rows by three columns. Uh, we have y is our uh, observation vector that is 25 rows by one column, and uh, that means that the x transpose x is going to be uh, a, um, a 3 by 25 dotted into a 25 by 3, gives us a 3 by 3 matrix, x transpose x. And the x transpose y is a 3 by 25 dotted into a 25 by 1. That gives us a 3 by 1. OK, so we've now got a 3 by 3 that we invert. That gives us another 3 by 3 matrix dotted into a 3 by 1. Uh, gives us another 3 by 1. And then we dot that 3 by 1 into a, um, into a uh, uh, 25 uh, by 1. So, uh, so now at the end of the day, uh, we end up with our uh, just our three coefficients here in the beta vector. Okay, so um, so let me go ahead and stop there. Uh